If you continue to argue about the existence of God, you will inevitably come across this argument if you haven't heard it ad nauseum already, depending on how long you've been involved with this debate. That's why I'm addressing it now, not because it's good, but because it's so pervasive. Now, there are variations, but essentially it goes like this. Imagine that this big circle represents all the knowledge that exists. Now, of all that knowledge, how much of it do you think you actually know? Very little, obviously. Whether you're a genius or a simpleton, because at that great scale the difference would be negligible, you're expected to accept that your knowledge should be represented by a tiny dot in comparison. So, if you can admit that of all this knowledge you only know a tiny fraction, how could you possibly say that God doesn't exist, when the proof of his existence might very well exist outside of your tiny dot of knowledge, somewhere within this big circle of knowledge, this 99.99999% of knowledge of which you are currently ignorant. How arrogant of me, right? Well, not so fast. This argument ridiculously dismisses all other arguments and logical principles ever conceived, and not just about God, literally about everything. In other words, it is the quintessential appeal to ignorance, rendering all rhetoric moot. For instance, let's try to use this argument against the disbelief in square circles. Let's say I describe something as perfectly square, having four equally spaced 90 degree angles, but that it is also a perfect circle, having no angles at all. Now, if you doubt that such a thing exists, would it then be a good response for me to tell you that this square circle might exist somewhere within all this knowledge of which you are currently ignorant? Will that convince you that the square circle I described to you is a coherent concept? No, because your inference about the existence of my square circle, as described, is being drawn not from what you don't know, but from what you do. This is why I can confidently doubt the existence of certain things. When it comes to God, it depends entirely on how you are defining God. The fewer claims you make about this God, the fewer beliefs or disbeliefs I will have about it because I'll have less information to go on. So, if you're talking about some vague deistic God, then I probably won't have much to say on the matter. If, however, hundreds of pages of allegedly inerrant text have been written about your God, then we can deduce all kinds of things about your God, including whether or not he actually exists as described. This is where every other argument comes into play and why you cannot simply dismiss every other argument using this gargantuan appeal to ignorance. Because if we're talking about the Abrahamic God, which we likely would be, then we certainly aren't ignorant about it. A final point to make about this particular appeal to ignorance is that we do not need to know the right answer in order to be able to reasonably reject someone else's answer. For instance, I do not know where my wife ate lunch today. Now, even though the knowledge of where she ate lunch exists outside of my little dot of knowledge and somewhere within the great circle of the unknown, I can reasonably deduce from what I do know that she did not, in fact, eat lunch on the surface of Mars. How about that? I don't know where she ate, yet I can still confidently say that it wasn't on Mars. How arrogant of me. Or is it? The same line of logic applies to how atheists can confidently disbelieve in your particular description of God. This is basic epistemology. So stop using these stupid appeals to ignorance to escape the actual reasons people have for justifiably disbelieving in your particular God.